Uh oh. Hey Sam. You ready? Yeah. <laughs> We're live, bro. Okay, let's do it. All right. <clears throat> All right, welcome, everybody. I know this is not uh, a very opportune time to do this. Uh, but when you can corral this guy right here, you do it. And this was the opportunity. So I'm excited because what we're going to do is we're going to pick the brain of Sam Nix and we're going to talk about everything training. And I'm excited because this guy's helped me out quite a bit. So uh, Sam is a coach owner at CrossFit Dallas Central. That's where I met him. So it's been quite a few years that he's been advising me on a lot of different training and I like to geek out about training and there's probably no bigger geek when it comes to training than this guy Thanks. right here. So uh, what I'll do is I'll let Sam talk for a couple minutes, kind of give his background and why he's here talking with us. Sure. So um, I've known Richard for a while. Um, Richard came to the gym actually before he got into biking, cycling. Um, and it was, you know, his background is from a fitness perspective. And if you knew Richard before he got into um, mountain biking, you know that he was a few LBs heavier than he was now and uh, into some different training methodologies. So he came to the gym. Our gym has been around for, um, we'll actually celebrate 10 years in, in uh, a couple of months. And um, we started, so my brother and I started the gym. We came from... Uh, both came from the private sector for strength and conditioning um, and then decided to uh, you know basically do this project of what we've been doing for um, mostly collegiate athletes but to do it for you know everyday people um, so we've been around for 10 years we're a crossfit gym um, we've got uh, two different locations they're both crossfit gyms crossfit is you know, sometimes kind of knocked on in certain communities, but with everything, it depends on the execution. Um, and really what CrossFit means for us is general physical preparedness. So most of our clientele here who are normal reoccurring folks are um, what, what Richard terms, what we all term as GPP athletes. So general physical preparedness means, um, you know, jack of all trades, master of none. But what we do a fair amount of that isn't as advertised because it takes an inordinate amount of effort. Um, and we live in a, a city, we don't live in Boulder. I wish we lived someplace like Boulder where everybody played a sport or participated in something like that. But um, what I tackle the most of in the, in the gym is um, helping people who have real specific needs. And so sometimes that comes from um, just a, you know, prehabilitation stance and recovering from injury or um, even things like autoimmune disorders that make training really challenging. Um, and then we have a fair amount of people who participate in specific sports. Um, and that's ranged anywhere from uh, really short, I mean the shortest event that we would train anybody for is, is an Olympic weightlifting or powerlifting meet where the, the effort is you know, less than a few seconds. Um, the longest sport that we've ever helped someone with is high alpine climbing. Um, and that ranges from people who've been really experienced with it to people who are brand new to it. We just had a guy who Came from a weightlifting background, got really interested in high alpine climbing, and just did his first like multi-day um, sojourn, um, and you know had the fitness for it. So, our perspective is, in terms of strength and conditioning, um, you know we don't have a bias per se, and some gyms definitely have a a slant on the way that they help people, and we try not to have a slant. What we really try to uh, to do is is to be in a position where um, you know any question that comes up. Uh, or any problem that needs to be solved in terms of sport or fitness, and there's distinctions between the two, that we have the ability to answer, at least answer that question. And sometimes that means we have to direct people to other practices, which I think is a healthy thing. Um, we've had a lot of people that we, uh, you know, have made to go do, you know, yoga and Pilates, because I'm not a yoga instructor, but we see that like some of that stuff has utility, but by and large, they're working with us. And um, so Richard and I, you know, developed this relationship with, cycling because when he was getting into this um you know the 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 richard of month one versus the richard of the last month is like a completely different person and we had a very very simple um you know maybe 30 45 minute conversation one day about how to train for this stuff and um it ended up thanks and it ended up um i think casting a pretty big 
Labs. I'm sponsored by Scratch Labs too. Uh, <laughs> it ended up, it ended up uh, having a pretty huge impact on his career. And it's not, um, you know, our, my, my perspective for endurance sports is pretty simple. And so whenever we get in these conversations, and and, I, and this is probably your experience that when someone asks, how do I get better at uh, you know, like long course cycling, enduro, whatever. They're looking for like the quick five minute sales pitch. Hey, if you just do this, then you'll be a, a, a really good cyclist. You'll be a really good biker. And um, and that's not the case. And most of the answers to those questions are actually pretty simple. The thing that's complicated is that it takes a lot of time. And it takes a lot of uh, like very direct effort. And we call that, um, you know, the, the extra science term is specific adaptations to impose demands. So the said principle, and the said principle just says that, um, you know, basically the quality that I'm trying to improve, I have to get exposure to that quality. But where we're, I think we're going to spend a lot of time today is that um, getting exposure to something to get better has to have some direction to it and some purpose. And it, it doesn't most of the time pan out for at least really good athletes to just do their sport all the time and really have no direction in it. So that's my spill. So yeah, no direction. Uh, that's something that I definitely appreciate because like you alluded to, we sat down, we talked, I did my first race, uh, I got destroyed. And having been around this facility and these guys, I understood very quickly, I need to adapt. Um, I need to tell my legs that they, they need to now do something different. Right. And that took a plan, and that right. plan took the better part of a year. But at the same time, one of the first things I noticed when I started racing cross country was I came in with a lot more muscle mass than everybody else, and that was looked upon as a detriment. It actually was an advantage in my opinion because as the race wore on, I could literally see other riders breaking down. They started already with horrible posture, and it only got worse, and that's because majority of them I didn't think did any strength training. They mm -hmm. had no midline strength, and they had nothing in regards to reverse chain strength. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I may not have been as fit, but I didn't break down near as much as the race wore on, and I was a better technical rider. Right. So that was one of the advantages I had, and I think that's what helped me progress so much quicker was I had strength. I just had to get the capacity to go longer distances and use that strength to my advantage right. and have it not be a detriment. Right, and that, that's, um, you know, I, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about that today, but that is, it's a big missing piece in, in endurance training. Um, and, I, and I think a, the a reason why it is a missing piece is because the term strength training is very misdefined with a lot of people. Um, and, you know, strength training, and like layman's, you know, common terms means, um, you know, bodybuilding is associated with that. Um, if you're deeper into the wormhole, it's like, well, if I strength train, it means that I have to lift a certain amount of weight and a certain frequency. Um, and there's a, I'm going to butcher this guy's name, but there's an old climber who's since passed, Tony Yamamo. And um, this guy was a, so he was a sport climber and he's a very, very strong guy and was a huge advocate of strength training. And one term that he used a lot was that, um, you know, endurance is a huge key, key component of our sport, but you have to have the strength to endure first. So in a real world application, like, um, and we'll take, we'll take uh, uh, high alpine climbing as an example. If you, uh, if you are doing a high alpine climb with a 60 pound pack and it's gonna take you three days, and to do a, let's put it in a gym term, to do a 24 inch box step up with a 60 pound pack is challenging in terms of strength. It doesn't matter what your endurance is if you're like lacking the single leg strength to step up on a box. And we can see those examples um, in the very start of some races where, um, you know, the, like the, in, so for cycling, like the little, the literal power per pedal stroke is significantly less than, than it would be for other athletes. But then we'll see, you know, strength is a huge buffer for fatigue, um, and people don't realize that. That uh, you know, the make or break at the end of a race is your ability to produce contractions under fatigue, um, and that ultimately is what the goal of um, aerobic work is. Is uh, it is you know to uh, sustain a certain amount of power even when fatigue creeps, and then what happens to your body is a buffer against that fatigue, and strength plays a big important component with that. And when we say power output, like we uh, we use that term a lot because 
you know, I'm going to go on a diatribe here, but there's a lot of ways to track like performance. So in a training session, you're going to say, what do you do? You use a power meter? People do. I yeah. Know. Uh, yeah. And some, do. you know, and that's the, probably one of the most common for cyclists because cycling is so, uh, like the terrain is so undulating. So to use a heart monitor doesn't make sense because, you know, my heart rate at a flat, um, you know, 20 mile clip is totally different than a graded five mile clip. And so to say I need to stay a certain heart rate monitor might change that. But what power is for us is power is simply the amount of force that you produce um, over the time required to produce it. So you could say, you know, the distance of a pedal stroke is defined and it's standardized. Um, how much power do you put to that pedal and then how long do you have to do it for? So power can be a relative term too. Um, you know, different, like, diff like enduro has a, a way different power requirement than, um, you know, something like, like lead bill. Yeah, yeah, cross country, something that's, you know, 100 miles plus in a day. But power is still a component in it and without getting super heavy in the exercise science behind it, um, you know, what strength training does is it ultimately, ultimately changes this, the quality of the cells and the muscle fiber. And if you look at, uh, you know, the cell as like an engine that produces power and then you have a lot of these little engines coupled together to produce a certain amount of power required, strength training helps improve that. And, it depends on the person that you're talking about, but you'll see, I think more often than not, that a lot of endurance athletes who especially have this like huge base of 20 years plus of ton, a ton of zone one work, um, and they find themselves stagnant, then including like some kind of strength training. But then the definition is different for that too. Like strength training to produce more power per pedal stroke is different than postural strength, which is, yes. um, you know, the midline strength to endure the position for so long. like. Um, I know that a lot of the amateur uh, athletes that we work with, like their only response isn't, it wasn't that I was gassed, it wasn't that I had, uh, you know, fatigue in terms of like, there was a crap ton of lactic acid in my body. It was, man, my back, uh, my back was really lit up. Uh, my ankles got really numb and strength training is what improves that. And yes, the adaptation specific to cycling also improves that, but I think you'll find that there's like a limit for how fit or how comparable you can be in cycling without strength training, and that limit is only gonna be improved with strength training. It depends on what that is. Um, and so, you know, the question becomes like, why should you strength train as an endurance athlete? And um, and what I think the first thing that, that someone would turn to, I think what you, what if you're listening to this, what you should turn to is what's your background? And one thing that benefited Richard from you know coming from a strength training background is he had such a, I mean, we're talking about a guy now who, what's the longest ride you've ever done? The longest ride ever? Yeah, ever. 120 So, which is, you know, compared to the length of your race, like pretty long. Oh yeah. So, somebody who came from a background where strength training wasn't like, yeah, I, I do some lunges with dumbbells, like 400 pound plus deadlift, 300 pound plus back squat, 250 pound plus bench press. So even though that strength is like take it, taking a significant decline, just having that base of strength to attach cycling to is only a benefit to you. And then, you know, to reverse that, if you're an athlete that like, hey, I've been riding my bike since I was 12 years old, and I started out with, um, you know, road cycling, and then that developed into some like more sexier, cooler, you know, mountain biking and, and all the different, um, you know, races that come into that, like to have that big of a base and to apply strength training on it is, very different, but um, what you'll find with strength training is one, there are certain lagging muscle groups that get to get to be brought up in terms of strength um, that you don't get in cycling, and the you know common term for that is cross training. So dare I say that the really really good athletes, at least a couple of months out of the year, um, will do some kind of cross training. And again, strength training for I'll t like strength training for a Tour de France cyclist might look like some push-ups and yoga positions and some TheraBand work because they need strength training about as much as a uh, you know 300 pound power lifter needs to run a mile, but you know it, it's still like somewhat needed. So it depends on you and depends on um, how long you've been in the game. But I won't find I don't think and I can say this with certainty I don't I don't think I'll find an athlete that in some form or fashion could tell me it will be to my detriment to strength train. But again, the definition of that has to be pretty adequate because, um, you know, we've seen this in like, 
what's the uh, CrossFit Endurance. So yeah. CrossFit Endurance is really popular, McKenzie, which was like Brian, Brian McKenzie. He's a great guy. Works with Laird Hamilton now, but um, you know his perspective was like it. Uh, you know everything that you do for um, your race needs to be really short, and high intense, and interval based, and then there needs to be a ton of strength training. And that makes sense if you have a 20 year aerobic base of running or cycling or swimming and then to attach some intensity on top of that only increases the peak of the fitness but um, if you don't have the base for that and you haven't spent adequate time on the bike then you know yeah like those are different circumstances so let's start with that let's start with that amateur athlete now you talked about tour de france that's definitely a whole different level like the other component of this i have to bring in is general health like I would argue those guys aren't very healthy no they're in incredible shape to do what they're doing but their biomarkers of health are be they'll be scary we're looking at unless they're on a real good doping plan you know that doesn't happen anymore no. uh, we're looking at the normal sort of person and we got my buddy Clinton Sylvie on here watching and he's a prime example guys pretty good enduro rider uh, he's fairly serious about it but he has a full-time job he has a life he has a family so for a guy like him, and I know he does a little bit of training, but if he doesn't, he's an enduro guy. We've already established he should do some strength training. And let's say you have, you know, and it comes back to return on investment. Let's say you only have four days to ride or four days to train. And you're taking those four days and you're riding because to get better, you have to ride. Right. My argument is you're going to be better if you ride three days and strength train prehab mobilize one of those days right so can you just kind of expound on on why why is that why would doing that one day <coughs> of, of strength training mobilizing help in the general scheme of things so it, it, and and yeah I get what you're saying it, 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 I think the the point that is missed by everybody is when you decide to embark on something specific meaning and we make a big distinction here between like exercise and training. And there's nothing wrong with either one. But I'll say that exercise is lifting weights and sweating and, and inner system work without an outcome. So it really doesn't matter what you do. And you show up every day and you say, this is the workout and it's great and I sweat. And there's immediate feedback to the day. Training is different. Training is there's a certain set of outcomes that I'm trying to approach and if my outcome is defined as X, then it means my approach has to match what the outcome is. The process has to match the outcome. And in terms of training for that, the definition has to be, yes, I want to compete in enduro, but what does that mean in terms of competition for me? So we sit down with a new athlete who's an, an amateur athlete and says, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I want to get into this mountain biking thing. And I watched a lot of YouTube videos, and I think enduro is good for me because I came from a motocross background. And uh, and man, I can handle a bike well. And then I say that's great, but what is what does training for enduro mean to you? You know what? I want to be a nationally ranked enduro athlete. And then I'll say that's awesome. So let's accept that there's going to be some degradation of health along the way. There might be some. You know, there might be some injury, and I'm not saying because cycling is injurious, but like, hey, at some point you're going to push it hard enough, you might fall off your bike, and that's accepted. Uh, and that's different than someone saying, no, I want to mountain bike and I like this format, but man, health is really important to me. And you have to make those distinctions. When we get people who want to train for a sport, I mean, in a, in a, in a real world example, we'll say like, especially for CrossFit as a sport of fitness, if you're talking about fitness. Like, hey, that's great, but uh, are you okay having a knee injury at some point? And that person will say, I don't give a shit about a knee injury because when I'm 80 years old and I've gone through the motion, you know, I've, I'm like, I've won all that I need to win and I have a trophy box in my living room, I could give two shits about having a knee brace on. And other people might answer that question differently. So for someone who is an amateur and um, is doing this for fun, there is a spillover point where there has to be some sacrifice of health and fitness and it depends on how you define health and fitness too. I define health and fitness as, and this is an old Dan John term if you know this, but it's the you know optimal interactions of all of your body systems, and that doesn't that doesn't necessarily mean uh, defined in a certain you know how much you can squat and how fast you can row and how far you can run, but um, for real, I want to go get blood work done and I want my blood work to come back really really clean, 
And, and if that was my perspective, then it would mean I'm going to do basically as much as I can until I see that those start to slip. And that's like my stopping point for how into something that I get. And the crossing over that threshold only comes from someone saying, yeah, I want to take this really seriously. And I'm okay if I have some loss of muscle mass or I have some, you know, weird gut digestion issues because I have to, I'm pounding so much goo. It's like, you know, like you, you got to accept that stuff. So for somebody who's an amateur, um, you know, the most important things, and this is what goes into a sport like if we're talking about enduro, there's a high, a high power requirement for enduro. So, you know, if you talk about the base for uh, contraction coming from how, how hard the muscle fiber can fire um, or how many muscle fibers can fire together, it makes sense that there's some strength training included in that. Um, there's a huge technical component to riding a bike that not a lot of people get. So I think the two extremes would be, I want to get better at enduro, so I'm just going to ride my bike every day. And maybe every once in a blue moon, I'll get out to a trail, I'll get to some sweet single track, because Dallas has some sweet single track, and you're like, you know, and that's what I made my money in terms of technique. And then the opposite of that is, you know, I don't have the time to do it. I don't want to commit uh, loading up my bike and going out somewhere three or four times a week. So I'm going to do what I think is a lot of sports specific work inside of the gym. And I'm going to hope that that carries and transfers over to my cycling prowess. And, and most of the time, like it does if you're a pure beginner. Because if you're unadapted to anything, anything that you do that looks like that sport is going to improve that sport. But then there's a, you know, there's a, the easiest people to train for us are the people who've never done anything before. Because I could say, hey, you get on those uh, assault bikes, the you know air bike that we have in here, and if you did that for a month and then you hopped on your bike, you'd be a better cyclist. So let's stick on that for a second. You're saying those people, and there's a lot of people out there, especially in the world that I'm in, cross country enduro, that have never done any form of strength training. Right. And based on what you just said, if they do something, that could be air squats and push ups, and if you have the ability, some sort of pull up. Just those three things, you're saying they would see some pretty big right. improvement. Right, and and um, I'll even you know say to further define strength training for cycling. When we define strength training for a sport, we take a look at the sport, and then we take a look at like predominantly what are the movement patterns and what types of contractions. So the movement patterns for cycling is very single leg dominant, duh. Um, but there's also you know you said pull up. Why do you say pull up for mountain biking? because I want to have good scat strength. Uh, when I'm trying to ride, especially in enduro, <coughs> and even in cross country, I don't want to fatigue. I need upper body strength to be able to maneuver the bike. One of my advantages is maneuvering through tight trees. We have a lot of tight trees here. I have an ability to get very quickly through those trees. Right. Part of it is I'm comfortable riding the bike, but the second thing is I'm strong. Yeah. Relatively speaking to everybody else, I'm strong so I can move it at a high rate of speed and that breakdown doesn't occur over the 90 minutes. Of I mean, break. and that's simply what like, that's what sport specific training is, is if I, if I had a snapshot of somebody on a bike and I said, well, I don't know anything about cycling, but I do know that it looks like they're holding onto these handlebars that are a little wider than shoulder width and their grip is taut and they have bicep flexion. And I see that really good riders have different posture than really bad riders. And then what movement looks like that in the gym? And I'd say, yeah, pull up looks pretty similar to that or a ring row or whatever, like some pulling action. Well, yeah, I like <coughs> ring rows because with a ring row, it's very difficult. And second, you're working some bit on it. Right. And I think that's the important thing. Just to break it down simply, if you're a cross country or even an enduro rider, start doing push-ups and do the best, most specific push-up you can, meaning um, vary your grips, uh, try and be a plank, tighten your glutes, tighten everything, make it the hardest push-up you possibly can because you're gonna work your midline a little bit more. Um, do some sort of reverse chain. So reverse chain is everything you can't see in the mirror. Lower back strength is incredibly important. Hamstring strength, glute strength, all of that. Right. So if you can find something simple, like if you got a kid, hold your kid and do reverse lunges. Do an elevated split squat, do anything like that and you can find any implement. But if you do some sort of, of press, like a quad dominant, hamstring dominant, lower movement, uh, something pulling for scap retraction and something pushing and then mix in, do some planks. You know, you're sitting there watching TV, do some planks, front planks, side planks, things like yeah. that. It could be that simple, right? Yeah. For and it doesn't have to be a, it doesn't have to be a, you know, one or two dedicated sessions per week. We've had some, we've had some success, I'd say a lot of success of, um, 
you know, for instance, okay, my split per week is I've got two strength training days and then one day where I get on my road bike and I ride around the lake and it's 10 miles and then another day where, um, you know, I actually get on some trail and it's more technical undulated terrain. But it doesn't have to be like that. It could be like, yeah, I want to ride four days a week, but I know that uh, my morning ride on Tuesday, when I come home, I've got 20 minutes. So that's 20 minutes of, um, you know, I got a, okay, I got a sandbag and it's 50 pounds. And I hug the sandbag and I lunge and I do some plank holds and I do some push ups and I put a pull up bar in my doorway and I'm trying to increase the number of pull ups that I get. And then for strength training for endurance athletes too, um, it's never to failure. So one, one thing, you know this from your bodybuilding background, but um, you know muscle hypertrophy and adding mass on, a lot of, a lot of the, the reason that happens is blood shuttle them in the muscle which comes from failure. So it has to be strength training that's productive for contractions but isn't unproductive for increasing the size of the muscle. And that is for an amateur athlete. For a really experienced athlete, I'd say, actually it's the opposite. Actually. 80% of your muscle mass has to be below your belt and 20% of it has to be above your belt. So, you know, you get, you talk about those like really advanced guys. Yeah, I get to like, you know, tour to California, like kind of shape. Levi Leinfeimer, I promise you, doesn't do one pull up, but his uh, arms are about as big as my wrist <laughs> and that's what he needs for the specific adaptation for that. So there's a question that just popped up that said, Let's say, so Clinton again, let's say I have three days, uh, I can ride three days and strength train two. Should the strength training be heavy low rep or more cross and style circuit? So again, the, the, the definition of both of those, so what did that say, high rep low load or high load low load? <laughs> We're pulling it back up. We're having some computer difficulties. Dang it. It's okay. So I'll answer the question like pretty directly and I kind of alluded to that. Um, strength training for a cyclist, it can, so, if you want to look up um, somebody in Texas, if you live high in Texas. High weight, lower rep. High weight, lower rep, right. So if you want to look in Texas, there's a, a strength training coach in, uh, there's a strength training coach in Wichita Falls, his name's Mark Ripito. And Mark Ripito is a really funny guy. If you ever get on his website, he has, and get on the message board and get on this string that says, Mark Ripito answers questions, and it's some of the funniest stuff that you can find. And one of, one of uh, you know, the great things about Mark Ripito is it's very simple, it's very direct. It, most, most of his strength training very revolves around, very direct. <laughs> most of it revolves around barbell work, but he's worked with a fair amount of cyclists. Um, we used to have a, a guy here who rode on um, 7-Eleven, his name's Chris Ronan, and he rode on Team 7-Eleven back in the day with Lance. And um, so this guy's like six foot seven, 260 pounds, and he did crits. And, you know, it, and I would say like uh, a crit race is very similar to an enduro race. It's a little more technical. It's way more intense. There's like, you know, dudes throwing elbows, knocking people off bikes in the corners. So this guy strength trains. It's never to failure. It's not muscle hypertrophy. You know, low repetition for um, an, an endurance athlete. Like I see tens and twenties for a back squat, and I think that's really high repetition for me. But for someone who's used to doing like, you know, 50 reps per set. Um, a, a set of 10 on a squat is actually pretty low repetition and pretty high load. But this guy, Chris Ronan, was giving me this anecdote that he was like, you know, I had this 15 year base of cycling and then I worked with Mark Ripito and got my 10 and my 20 rep max back squat really high. And he was on a, you know, these are the old, old frame bikes so they're different than they are today, but he was like, I was so strong, I had a few frames that I ripped the stem off the bike and a few frames where I cranked so hard on a pedal stroke, I, I like broke the crank set off the bike. And for something as intense as enduro or crits or whatever we're talking about, like, yeah, that's, that's pretty important. What's not important, because you're already getting it, is the amount of contractions. So if you measure, you know, if I go ride for an hour and I measure that I had 5,000 pedal strokes, is it really gonna make a big difference in terms of stimulus for you to continue that format on another day or, and we're talking about the amateur athlete to produce higher, uh, like higher quality power in his pedal stroke. Now, it actually makes sense for me to say I literally have gotten stronger, and it has to be a measured thing. So, a, a measurement for that might be one one measurement tool that we use for single leg strength, for instance, is uh, a, a Bulgarian split squat. So, you get a bench, like a knee height bench, take three steps away, put your back foot on the bench, then you squat till your back knee touches the ground. And a, the gold standard for that for anybody 
is one third of your body weight per hand for eight reps. So I weigh 200 pounds, that means I have to have 70 pounds in each hand for eight reps per leg. If I could do that, that is an insane amount of single leg strength. And tell me that that wouldn't completely carry over and transfer to somebody who's cycling. Um, even deadlifting, you know, the, like the action of pushing down against the ground to produce force, and that the joint angle of deadlifting is very, very similar to cycling. But to say that I need to do, you know, cr CrossFit style circuit training, like I need to pick three or four, uh, you know, light-ish movements, and I need to do them for time for 20 minutes, um, I, I would argue that that might not be the best route to go. Uh, one, because it's hard to measure. Two, because you get in this middle ground that we call no man's land, where, and this is, this is what I'm talking about, about the contention of like, I only have like 30, 45 minutes to strength train, so what do I do? To say, I need to pick something that is hard enough, um, that I feel like I'm getting hard work, but isn't actually productive is what we term no man's land. And that's like, I need to feel like I did something hard, but the amount of weight that I lifted relative to the rep range or whatever, it wasn't actually that hard. And that's like, that's like the zone two no man's land for aerobic work is it has to be easy enough to produce an aerobic, and then we're talking about heart rate training, but it has to be easy enough and long enough so that I can say my, my heart is, like my aerobic quality is improved, or it has to be really freaking hard. Like the heart has to be hard, the easy has to be easy. But you get these guys that, um, you know, I've only got 30 minutes, so I'm gonna get on my bike, and I'm gonna ride really hard for 30 minutes. It wasn't actually hard enough to be called tempo or um, threshold work, but it wasn't slow enough to be called aerobic work and they end up floating in this no man's land of not really accomplishing a lot. And if we're talking about health and fitness, you know, three or four weight, weight lifting movements for 20 or 30 minutes in a circuit style, it's like that's been proven time again to really improve fitness, you know, fitness and health markers. But for sport, it's not. And, you know, I think we could maybe start the conversation by saying, if I'm confused about what to do, I gotta look at the guys who are at my level who are really successful, who have similar lives to me, and what are they doing? And I promise you that none of those guys are doing a ton of CrossFit. And if they are, then you gotta do the investigation further to say, why is CrossFit helping them? Well, it's because this guy had done nothing but be on a bike for 20 years, and then he got bored on the bike or stagnant, he found a CrossFit gym that had pretty good coaches, and anything different and more intense than what he'd been doing for 20 years is gonna improve his base, you know, for, for the yeah. sport that we're talking about. Which, you know, bringing it back to CrossFit, CrossFit can be a good thing for these amateur athletes right. that like to ride a lot on the weekends you have to have the proper gym and you have to go in understanding you need to train to a level where it's not detrimental to what you're doing on the bike right. and that's that's something that can happen and we can circle that back around like for Clinton should you go heavy should you go low rep you should go heavy enough and low enough reps where it's still going to be uh, a benefit to you you don't want to let the pendulum swing too far where you start to go too hard and you break down and you don't heal, you don't recover enough to then perform at your race. Like right. a great example is my programmed workout yesterday had Bulgarian split squats. So rear leg elevated split, split squats. This is a race week. So I, I have to drive to Arkansas. I have to pre-ride. I have to race on Sunday. I did those unweighted. It was four sets, 10 reps each side, unweighted. And I would normally do those with about 40 pounds, which going back to what he said with the test, I'm nowhere near where I should be as a 170, 180 pound guy. I would need to be able to be going a little bit heavier, but that's okay because I still see the benefits. There was a time and a place when I could do those eight reps with that percentage of my body weight, right. but I was considerably heavier and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be good at what I'm doing now. Right. It wouldn't serve me in a good way. Yeah, I, I think that's why I think that's why measurement is important for you know. First is what's my definition for strength, and then two is what's my measurement to define if I'm improving that strength. And um, you know, I'll say like to say let, like let's let's take a, a literal example for someone we've used before. Um, I want to become a better runner, and maybe split squat is the thing that I'm using for that. And so I test my split squat and it's really, really low. And I do what I think is productive based on my, my why and the outcome for my you know, performance. And I see my split squat every two weeks, I do that eight rep test on per, you know, per leg. 
and I see that it creeps up by five pounds. And um, you know, we'll make a, a cutoff point for people preseason to say, hey, it's, you know, the goal, yeah, that would be great if you could do a third body weight, but maybe like 40 pounds is where we need to get for you. And then as soon as you can get a 40 pound split squat, we've developed really good single leg strength, and now we're gonna take that strength and go apply it to some someplace else. And that's called periodization. And that is you know, developing an aspect of, of fitness that is going to improve other aspects of fitness down the line. But again, that depends on the person. So, you know, an amateur athlete, I think you could say, if the thing that I'm measuring is my outcome are my races and my amateur races, that whatever I do in the gym or whatever I do in my split in terms of being on the bike and time and attention on the bike per week, it always has to improve that one outcome, which is my race, my race result. And if I do, this is this process of like always, you know, the synthesis, antithesis, synthesis, which is I did this for two months and it improved my race. And what's my answer to that? And whatever you did, you need to keep doing because it's worked. But if I decided, well, you know what, I'm gonna start doing uh, this powerlifting split or I'm gonna attend CrossFit more. And what you perceive in improvement of fitness, which comes from, I look better with my shirt off and my delts got a little bigger. And <clears throat> you know, man, I could never deadlift 300 pounds and now I can deadlift 300 pounds. And if I got back to my race and my results were worse, and it wasn't from some other tertiary quality like yes. my sleep was shitty, or I realized like Richard, you know, the couple of videos back was like, hey, there's a lot of food I'm allergic to. If it wasn't something from that, then I'd say, yeah, whatever you did that impacted your race negatively, you gotta take that out again. And, the, and, and, and that's why it took you a year to figure that out, because it was a year of trial and error. But I, I could say that with some certainty that somebody who's an amateur cyclist, if they had 80% of their program was on the bike and it was intelligent, meaning the rides that were supposed to be hard and technical and fast were actually literally hard and technical and fast. And the rides that were supposed to be slow and fun and conversational and was like, you know, we're gonna go from here to Forney and back on our road bikes on the weekend, like they actually were easy. And the other 20% was strength training. Strength training can be a, a really potent recovery tool. I don't think you mentioned that, but you know, to get off the bike and do something different and, it, and in terms of body systems, the complete opposite of being on a bike for a really long time, it will improve your, your quality of, of ride and it does impact uh, recovery and it does ultimately help with yes. the specificity of the bike. So I think that's what the contention is. This pendulum swing between am I training for a sport and I'm okay having body composition changes, I'm okay losing muscle mass in certain parts. I'm okay looking super bottom heavy, but you know, that's what's required for my sport. Or no, I want to ride the bike, but I also am concerned about my health and fitness and I want to be a certain body weight and I want to have a certain body composition. Um, there's, there's that pendulum and you gotta just figure out how much you want it to swing to one way. And then once you figure that out to say, well, is CrossFit important to me? It can be, it can be if, if you're riding for fun, like ride for fun, ride your bike a lot, but you don't race and you're not concerned about it. And will you be a better cyclist for it? I think hands down you will be. But you know, I, I can tell you that a lot of guys, especially in CrossFit, they get real wrapped up with like the competition in the class. And um, we say this a lot as the goal, the goal is to keep the goal the goal. So we have someone who comes in who says, I want to race and um, this is my sport. And six months later, they don't get better at their sport, but hey, my uh, the number of pull-ups that I can do and my deadlift and my Fran time and my 2K row all improved. Man, that's so great. But did you actually improve in, in the race? Nah, but I look good with my shirt off now. And then I'll say, I didn't do Which my that's job important. right. It is important. It's important but for a lot. I'll say, if that, was, if that was the goal that brought you here, unless you're gonna admit to me that your goal changed and the, the why that brought you here changed, then I haven't done my job adequately. And there's a lot of ways to cut. That's why guys get their PhDs. Uh, you know, with exercise, they might not be the most personal dudes ever, but that's why you can get a PhD in this stuff because it's insanely complicated. Um, but again, it just depends on, it's like defining that why, like why am I doing this thing? Um, why is it important to me? And then every input that I have into the system has to relate back to that why. And that's why we're very, you know, process focused and not outcome focused is yes. you, you defined the why, you wrote it down, you put it in an envelope, you put it in your drawer, and then you started to train. And then that why, you know, let's say the why was, I just want to like have fun in a couple of races. But what if you realized in that process that you were way better than you thought you were? 
And that Y ended up being like very, very low in terms of your capacity for output than you realized it could be. It's good to exceed those things. But it's also good to say, hey, along the road, my Y might have changed a little bit, but it's the process that's really important. And that's where this stuff gets really convoluted, but also gets really, really fun because it's never ending. Three other Ys that came to mind when you started saying that are Ys that I think appeal to 99% of people riding their bike and maybe even 100. And those are health, injury prevention, and recovery. So if you're that person out there that just rides for fun, you certainly don't want to get injured. If you ride a mountain bike, you ride at places like North Shore, there's a really good chance you're going to fall. Right. And if you have a little bit of GPP, <coughs> you have a little bit of strength up top, you can do some push-ups, you can right. do some pull-ups. There's a better chance that that collarbone won't break. Uh, you'll be able to react a little bit quicker. Oh, yeah. Or let's say you're in that situation where you have that crash and thankfully you have a little bit of strength that prevents right. injury. Now you're not going to be as wrecked as you were without it. So let's say you didn't have that strength, but you got lucky and you didn't break the collarbone. But you're going to wake up the next day and feel like you got hit by a truck. Right. We can prevent a lot of those things. And that's literally where the, the research came from in the beginning for stress and adaptation was from car wreck victims back in the 20s and uh, or the 30s or whenever cars started wrecking. But it was, uh, you know, that uh, getting in a car wreck had a certain stress on your body and then people would find that they actually had like um, improvements in terms of strength in a muscle fiber because the response to stress is always to become more resilient so that when I incur that stress again, it's no longer a stressor to me. And that's what, that's what strength training is. That's what progression is. Um, and progression, <coughs> it's funny, progression, one of the things I've heard people say, and a lot of times it's female athletes, I don't want to get big and bulky. I don't right. want to look like a bodybuilder. And one of the best analogies I ever heard is, it's like the alphabet. You have to go from A to Z. You're not gonna start training, you're not gonna pick up a weight and all of a sudden be massive. Right. You have to go from A to Z. So if you get to, I don't know, L or M and body composition wise, you feel like maybe you're putting on a little bit too much muscle, you make some changes and that's easy to do, but don't let that be what deters you from actually picking up some weights. Right. And, and this goes to everybody. I'm not just focused on uh, guys here. This is all athletes. If, if you're riding a bike, if you're running, all those things, the strength training component, it's gonna help. Especially for somebody who hasn't done any of it, it's really gonna help. And another part of this too is, um, and you, one of the first things you said is prehab. So my, my strength training, uh, it covers a lot of different things. It covers mobility. I drive a lot so my hips are closed off. Um, I try and do everything I can to keep my hips open. I'm constantly looking at imbalances. Right. So I do unilateral movements um, as much as I can because that helps translate to what I'm doing on the bike. You don't have to get incredibly crazy about it, but if you just do something. So for example, let's look at it this way. Let's say somebody out there is a, a recreational, sometimes racing, cross-country rider, you know, mid-30s, mid-40s. They don't have any equipment. They don't have a gym. They don't have any specific implements at home. What is one simple workout that that person could do? So there, there are five, it's a great question. There are five, what we define as five different movement patterns that the human body can go through. And so those movement patterns are an upper body push, which you can further declinate into horizontal pushing, vertical pushing. So like a military or a strict press for vertical pushing, and then a push up for horizontal pushing. But upper body pushing, upper body pulling, hinging at the hip, which is a good morning, a kettlebell swing, a deadlift, um, squatting, and then we have a, another category which gets fickle of like midline work. Um, and that can, that's all, those are the movement patterns, those can be applied to single leg work and double leg work. Um, you know, again, we're making this contention that like, um, you know, sports that are acyclic, like, uh, you know, mountain biking is very cyclic because it's the same thing over and over and over again. Sports that are acyclic like uh, jiu-jitsu where it's not the same position over and over again. So you can make, you can take those five motor recruitment patterns and you can apply them at will based on the sport. But if I am an amateur recreational cyclist, then it is totally okay to say, especially if it's like once or twice a week, yep. that all, all of those sessions in some form or fashion, I'm gonna touch 
all five of those. So off the top of my head, here's one where, here's, here's a workout where there would be like an equal amount of effort put into each five of those categories. So I, I have a, let's say I do a push up and I do a ladder from one to 10 back down to one. So that's like 120 something push ups uh, or one or 10 down to one, whatever, 55 push ups. I do something with uh, push ups. I do a single leg split squat, which is the squat. Um, then I have a band, I have a fair band. I step on it, I put it around my neck. I do band good mornings. I do side planks. Um, and then I finish with some bent over rows and I got a five gallon water jug and I did three sets of, you know, 10 to 15 reps, whatever. Rep range is, is negotiable here, but I have all five of those movements present. And those are, that's like an equal amount of effort put into all five. But I might say, okay, one day is gonna be very lower body dominant. And this is where you can get really geeked out of where like template programs never work, right? Because- <laughs> Let's so, keep the geek level right? low and so, super simple. Somebody super who doesn't simple have any- like, Okay, let's say that you want to break this up into a lower body and upper body day. Because Monday is the only day you can strength train and Sunday is the only day that you can ride long. So what does Monday have to be? My legs are trash from the ride on Sunday. Yep. I want to lay off them for a day. So I might say, okay, we're actually going to do 50% of our work is upper body pushing and upper body pulling. And then I'm going to finish with some unloaded lunges and a few anchored sit-ups or L-sits or glute bridges, whatever. Um, but most of my work and the hard work is put into, uh, we call, like that's training, we call touches, is just getting a little bit of work into something to say that I did it. And then the other day on Thursday or Friday is my lower body day and that's where I have, you know, heavy single leg RDLs and the split squat or I do a goblet squat or whatever, step ups. Uh, and then I finish with three sets of 10 on push ups and, uh, you know, a few, like I do a couple of sets of, you know, I do one set of as many pull as I can and then I call it a day, like stuff like that. So I think it would, if you're trying to come up with this stuff uh, on your own, um, you know, the, the, my thesis, so you say my thesis is I'm gonna have all five movements present and I'm gonna do it twice a week. And what is governing how much I can do is what are the quality of my rides? And so I do that for two, three weeks and then I notice, you know, like my, my like energy and effort on writing kind of went down a little bit, I feel like it. So then the antithesis of that is, well, let's only do one day, or let's do one day where it's really upper body and one day that it's really lower body dominant. And then what comes out of that is, oh, my writing is great again. So that's what I'm gonna stick to for a while. And it's, you have to start with like a, the very, the most simple iterations of that. Um, and then over time with experience and then tracking, you know, data is so important, but tracking the results of that, you end up with, you know, this is what my plan looks like after six months of teeter-tottering with it and how it relates to my writing. And that's why template programs blow, uh, because a template program with a certain split and a certain amount of writing, like that was written at one point for this one person or this one kind of person that in no way, form or fashion will be you. And uh, the best athletes, I mean the best athletes on earth, even the ones that have coaches, are very intuitive athletes. And um, you know, we could, like, you could get some guy, we've, we've done this a lot, we'll get guys who are really intuitive, experienced athletes, we'll give them a heart rate monitor, and we'll say, I want you to do an hour, and on the heart rate monitor, it's going to be 150 beats per minute. And what does that look like? And then we'll take the monitor off of them, and we'll put tape over the screen of the bike, and we'll say, now do an hour of what you think is 150 beats per minute, and it almost one-to-one -one is the exact same wattage and the exact same heart rate, and they're just really intuitive athletes, but. So hang on, hang on, It hang takes on. a really long time. I got, time a, I got a funny story about that. Um, and some people, I think, will appreciate this. Clinton might, too, because I think he's gotten this. Uh, a lot of people have asked me many times at Enduros, what's your, or even cross-country races, you know, what's your plan of attack, what's your strategy? And what I can tell you is, I work on percentages. So depending on how my body's feeling, how comfortable I am with the terrain, it's all a percentage. So I'll go into a race and I'll have percentages that I plan on working in and rarely are they ever above 95% because if I know, I know if I go above 95%, there's a really good chance I'm gonna crash. So I'll analyze stage by stage. And what I'll say is I'm gonna go out at 89 to 92%. And if for some reason I'm feeling it, there's an opportunity, I might bump that up to 95. 
And when I say those percentages to people, the look on their faces is priceless because they're thinking, well, wait a minute. And they even say this, how do you know, like, how can you say 89 to 92%? Part of how I feel I can say that is the training that he's programmed in years past. We would do workouts in the gym where it would be very specific percentages. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is I know based on my skill level and my fitness level where that pendulum starts to swing back the wrong way. So based on my fitness and how I feel about this stage, if I can creep it up to 92%, that's where I'm optimal. I may go faster at 98%, but the chances of me crashing or making a mistake are way more detrimental. And if I can stay at 93% and not make any mistakes, I'll go faster than I would have right. at the end. And that's not versus 98%. I mean, and that's not a percentage, you know, you so then the next question would be, well, what is that a percentage of? It's not a percentage of speed because you're not able to hold 100% of your speed or a speed that's gonna change all the time, but it's of, of a feeling and it's of effort. Of effort. And that's where, that's where in, intuition comes from. And that 100%, like this is where it gets convoluted and why you have to have experience and why like to get really, to get to that point means that you have to spend a lot of time doing this stuff and you can't just go ride once or twice a week. Because 100% on one race might be, well, 100% today based on me not having to travel and sit in the car this week and getting perfect sleep and having perfect nutrition. Today, that's what 100% means. But the next race that I have, those those you know precursor situations were different. So 100% doesn't mean that today. And that's why, you know, unless like unless you've done that race before and you're doing it under the same circumstances, you could say. Well, I know that actually on my test run, 100% meant an average on my power meter X amount of watts. Yeah. So that I'm trying, to, I'm literally trying to hold 85 to 92% of those watts. But it's an intuition thing, right? We had a we have a guy who has coached for us in the past who ran the 400 meter John Harris. Yeah. So he ran the 400 meter run um, in college, and he was he had ran that race so many times that he said in training, if I was doing, I'm going to butcher this, but like if I did a 50 two second, 53 second, 400. Um, I could tell the difference between that and a 55 second because one of them I was standing and one of them I had to lay down afterwards. And intuition said, oh, I had to lay down. I can tell you that was probably two seconds you know, faster than what I had done when I was, you know, whatever. So intuition plays a lot. But where does intuition come from? It's experience, it's time in the saddle. Um, you know, I know for, uh, I'm gonna butcher this too, but for ski mountaineering athletes, I know this number exactly. So for a recreational ski mountaineering athlete, um, I, I want to say it was something like two or three hundred hours of training per year was uh, what was required to be a competitive recreational ski mountaineering athlete. But to be a professional ski mountaineering athlete, it was like 550 hours per year. And so that's like, you know, every day, sometimes multiple hours on the, you know, per, um, that describes the amount of effort that you have to put into something to be that good, to be that intuitive of an athlete. Yeah. And, you know, if you want to, if you want to get really jazzed, and um, I've had so much coffee and caffeine right now, but if you want to feel like you have, so get on, get on a, a guy's website. His name's Mark Twight. Mark Twight is a, a world-renowned alpine climber turned cyclist, ski mountaineer, and also started a gym in Utah that he's no, not a part of anymore, but he has this article on his website and the article is called there's no such thing as a free lunch and it describes his journey with crossfit where his 20 30 year base of alpine climbing went to a crossfit level one got suckered into the you know you know what it's not mileage that's getting me there it's going to be intensity and he talks about that process with which ended up realizing yeah, if I want to get good at cycling, I'm going to have to spend a crap ton of hours on the bike. And he, he tracked that really well. So one year he was like, I had 200 hours on the bike and I had 150 hours of gym, gym time. And this is what my race result was. And the next year I had like 30 hours of gym time. And here's how much better of a cyclist I got. And it's, it's a really motivational article to give yourself the permission that it's okay if you're not at a CrossFit gym or you're not strength training three or four days a week and only riding, you know, intervals on the weekend or whatever, like, you know. So why, tell everybody why they're familiar with Mark Twight. What movie makes them familiar with him? Mark Twight <laughs> was the strength and conditioning advisor for the 300 movie. 
Uh, but Martins. one of the reasons why that works so well, and again, this is why I like this guy so much. So he, Zack Snyder, who directed that movie, who also directed Justice League and Superman vs. Batman. Geek time. Geek time. So <laughs> Zack Snyder, back in the day, was doing a Jeep commercial, and they had a scene where they needed someone to help with this climbing footage that they were getting. So they hired Mark Twight, and then Mark Twight was starting this gym out called Jim Jones, and they developed this relationship. But for those guys, you know, most, and this is the specific adaptation to impose to man, why even in a bodybuilding setting, it's, it, it makes sense. So he had these guys for this movie that needed to be lean and looked like they lived off the land and they were warriors. Most Hollywood paradigms, believe it or not, is you need to look like that. So here's your pharmaceutical program that we're gonna get on, plus a crap ton of machine-based bodybuilding. And we're gonna, you know, and also you're gonna smoke, you know, Brad Pitt and Fight Club, you're gonna smoke cigarettes and take vitamin pills. That's all you're gonna eat apples for six months. But these guys were on a plan that um, you know was like, what would it actually look like if you were living off the land and if you had to train like with a minimal amount of gear and a maximal amount of effort. But the, the the way that he approaches that stuff is like, this is the goal. The goal is to keep the goal the goal. And so whatever that means for improving that, that's what it's going to end up being. And it might not be very fun, and it might not look super sexy. Jason Momoa. I can. This is the last thing I'll say because I'm geek out about this guy. He's playing Aquaman and the Justice League. He does so much sport climbing because the body type and the body composition they needed was you gotta look like you actually swim in the water. One body type that's very similar to a swimmer is a climber for somebody who's that tall. So he does a crap ton of climbing for his training. And yeah, he squats and yeah, he pushes sled. But anyways, diatribe. If you wanna get good at something, you have to put the work in. You have to define what that thing is like what that outcome is actually for you. Yes. You have to define why you want to do it. There's, even if the goal is really sharp, if there's no buy-in and there's no emotional economy to that, uh, the atmosphere with which you're going to put yourself in is completely detrimental to performance uh, because you're doing what someone else told you that you should do instead of what feels valid. And everything's valid as long as it's honest. So if you define what that why is and then you know that the training always circles back to that, um, and you keep it really freaking simple. I love this. The best programs on earth are the ones that are simple that make impact. Because what I don't give a shit about is, hey, uh, I was a cyclist and I, uh, I was a marathoner and I joined a CrossFit gym and I took my marathon from six hours uh, to four hours and 45 minutes. And I won't give a crap about that because anybody who runs a six hour marathon and does anything is probably gonna improve the marathon by a little bit. But I want to know about the program in the CrossFit gym that says, yeah, I had a uh, four hour marathon and I took it to two hours and 59 minutes. And then I want to go, what is going on in that gym or what is going on with you that got you to that point? And I don't know if I would find that unless this per genetic freak, right? I never ran before. I joined a CrossFit gym. I ran a little bit and I ended up doing a 259 marathon. Then I'm going to find, I'm going to discover someone who has like an world class genetics. That's an outlier. outlier. Yeah. Yes. So it's, I think it's pretty simple. Uh, if we break it down based on everything that was said, at the lowest level, if you're somebody that wants to get better at life, which I think everybody should, a little bit of strength training is only going to help you. It's gonna make everyday life better. You're gonna wake up feeling better. You probably will have slept better the night before. Then if you ride bikes, you will do better riding your bike. You will have more fun. You will go longer it will be easier to ride longer and have more fun with people. And then if you step it up a level, let's say you're a fairly recreational racer, if you get a little bit more focused with that training, maybe dial in your nutrition a little bit, you'll get even better. So you'll compete a little bit more and that may lead you into the next level of person. And that's somebody that, you know, they're actually putting a decent investment into this. They're still an amateur athlete, but they want to be good at cross country. They want to get better at enduro. Maybe they're eyeing, hey, someday I want to ride at a pro level. That being the case, you do a little bit of research based on the things that we talk about, right. and you formulate a program, but you keep it simple. Um, I see a lot of videos. I'm all over Instagram. We geek out about all these pages, and there's people out there that are doing crazy things. Like, I see a lot of instability work like people squatting and doing different things on like a BOSU ball or a wobble board. I'm not gonna say there's not a place for that. Sam might disagree. Um, there might be a place for that. I can tell you, I would never do it. And that's somebody, that's coming from somebody who rides at a pro level, I've done fairly well, I have a decent amount of strength. I would never do that. 
because I'm not at that level. I'm not in a position or a place where I think that movement would benefit what I'm trying to do. And I see a lot of people that are way below me as far as experience, capability, and strength doing those movements when they would be better served doing some sort of squat, some sort of pull from the ground. Keep it simple. Uh, everybody wants to get sexy and do these crazy movements and go all over the place with different things. The simpler you can keep it, the less mental effort you're gonna have to put into designing right. it, and you can put that effort into executing it. Right. The simpler you keep it, the more chance there's gonna be that you will actually execute it. Right. And, get and that, that's the holistic perspective that we like, which is, you know, the, the first, I guess the first like, you have all these things that you can improve that improve the outcome. And the, the first place to go is, is there anything that is lacking that I'm not touching? And you could break that down into stress and, um, you know, state of hormones, gut health, what's my nutrition, what's my hydration, uh, like what a joints function like, do I know how to move well, do I have like good movement memory, um, what's my literal capacity for strength training for my aerobic fitness, my technical prowess for my sport. And the first place to go is I have to make sure that I'm covering all my bases and then how much do you cover in one aspect more than the other effort you put in one that only comes with an improvement in that in that thing that as I get better with my sport then there are some things I'm going to realize need more effort and some things I realize that don't um, you know right now gut health is really important to you but if you get to 140 pounds and you're racing at like a world level and going to Italy to do all these things I promise you you won't be eating pasta, but you'll be doing some things differently than you of did course. now in terms of nutrition. But you're going to accept, this is the thing that I needed to get better at this race. Yes, it gave me diarrhea, but I'm okay doing that because I could give two craps, of, no, no pun intended, yeah. I could give two craps <laughs> about that right now, right? So, whole, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, a holistic perspective first. And I think when you start with that as an amateur, it gives you an opportunity to take it in a lot of different directions. I always hate seeing people who want to dabble in something go so deep into it so quick. And then when they realize they don't want to do it anymore, they're so swung on the other side of the fence. They're like, well, I don't want to cycle anymore. I kind of want to lift, but man, I am so out of that world right now. I didn't really need to be. And now it's hard for me just to get back into you know, health and fitness work. Yeah, I think you've highlighted some things that will probably save for another one of these sessions because uh, you know gut health is important comes back to nutrition okay. so strength training and, and you said at one point man I'm, I'm just sore from that workout well you could be sore because you slept four hours the night before your nutrition was atrocious therefore your recovery from that strength training session was very bad right. so it wasn't the strength training session it was the poor sleep and it was the poor nutrition that were actually the problems. Right. So those are where we get that larger view of everything and I think you can get to that point. If you're gonna do some strength training, I think it's probably wise to look at your nutrition, especially pre and post workout and maybe even carry depending on what you're doing. Right. But uh, it's only gonna help. Uh, so yeah. yeah, definitely. We could go so much deeper into all these things, but Good. I think we've set up some things to do in the future. We got some great questions and I will get to those. We're having a little computer difficulty, so I wasn't able to pick up and answer all those questions. But Sam, thank you so thank much. You, this you. was everything for having I thought me. it would be. Uh, if you guys want, if you have further questions that uh, you know you want to expound on uh, with Richard and myself, you know how to find Richard. Um, our website is uh, traincfdc.com. Um, I'll give my email address out. My email is uh, Sammy Nix, S A M M Y N I X, at Gmail. Um, and, you know, hashtag SamFit. And the best place to start would be uh, send us an email so we can start a dialogue and then let's get you into the gym. We do a fair amount of um, assessing for fitness, um, even if we don't end up writing that plan, but just to give people uh, awareness of where they are in their fitness right now. But we'd love yeah. to talk about it. We geek, we geek out about this stuff so much. We're hobbyists before professionals. So, I'll never turn away a question and it's learning for me too. So thank you for having me. My pleasure, of course, and moving forward, my plan is to try and get some videos out of some of my strength training, write out some simple things. I won't necessarily call them programs, but I've tried to give some glimpses into what I do and I will continue to do that. And it always comes back to it's what I do. Uh, I'm not a certified personal trainer by any means, but I've been around some guys like this. 
that are pretty incredible. And, and I'm I, not a certified personal trainer yeah. either. Yeah. I, I have very so little original thought on this. Everything I will say that things. over again. I have very little original thought. I yield to guys that are experts in the field that have had a lot of time, that have invested a lot of hours. And I ask questions and I use that information to uh, adapt into what my program needs and I move forward with it. The less I have to concern myself with it mentally, the more I can focus on my effort in the gym and getting it done. So there are some advantages to that. So cool. with that, thank you, sir. Thank you. I appreciate it. Happy ride. Have a great Thursday. We'll see you guys again soon. Hang on. Hang on.